while, while you find your place in Acts chapter number 20 this evening, I'm going to read a couple of verses of Scripture to you uh, in Paul's epistles. Uh, Acts chapter 20 will be a story from the ministry and the life of Paul. And I'd like to read a couple of verses to you <clears throat> out of a couple of different epistles of this great apostle uh, that would give us maybe a little context and give us a little uh, spiritual comparison help as we fall into the message tonight. Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle Paul said in verse number 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. In this text, Paul is not talking to lost people. He's talking to saved people. You say, but preacher, I thought if we're saved that we are not of the dead anymore. I thought God raised us up. We were dead in trespass and sin. That's true. But Paul here does not accuse the Ephesians of being dead. He accuses them of looking dead. Uh, if I was to roll in two caskets down in front of the church and one had a freshly dead body in it and the other one had a person in it that was just deep in sleep from the back of the building, you couldn't tell them apart. You know, the problem with a lot of Christians is that God resurrected them. They got life into them but they fell for a demonic lullaby, lulled back into sleep, and from a distance, you really can't tell them apart from a lost man tonight. Paul said, I don't want you just to be resurrected. I don't even want you to look like you're dead anymore. Uh, arise from the dead. Get out the graveyard. Stop laying back down where God got you from, covering back up with the dirt tonight. Romans chapter 13, Paul says something similar. In verse number 11, he says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. I'd say if the time was advanced to a certain point all the way back in Paul's day, uh, then the hourglass has almost totally run out tonight. Uh, and with those two thoughts in mind, I have to think that when Paul wrote those two scriptures, he had this particular ministerial event in his mind. I must think that when Paul penned these words down, I just read to you under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, his mind went back, Preacher Foster, to this event in his ministry and was reminded once again how dangerous it is to go to sleep, not just physically, but spiritually tonight. Verse number 7, Acts chapter 20, you're with us tonight. Why don't you do me a favor and stand while we read this text because you've been sitting just a little while and we'll let you stand. Daddy always said the mind can only take in what the rear end can endure. And uh, we're going to let you stand here for just a minute. Verse number 7, And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Can I tell you, your friend, if you ain't got nothing else to thank God for, at the end of my message tonight, you can thank God right now that it ain't going to last till 12 a.m. It ain't going to go this long right here. Give me 35, 40 minutes and Cody going to shut up, sit down, and we're going to go get supper. Hallelujah. Uh, if you can't thank God for nothing else about this message, you want to thank God right now, Lord. I appreciate the fact that that dude ain't going to hold us here till 12 o'clock tonight. Amen. Yeah, I ain't going to be a Pharaoh preacher. I'm going to let God's people go. That's right. Uh, so, some preaching some preaching that I've heard down south is, is like a big longhorn steer. Two points and a whole lot of bull in between. Amen. That's right. I ain't going to do that to you tonight. I'm going to give you something and we're going to go. Ver verse number 8. Paul continued his speech to midnight. Verse 8. There were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed 
And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Thank you. You can be seated tonight. Here some time ago, God directed my heart at our church to do a study uh, and do different messages through the Word of God on windows in the Word. If you'll study your Bible, the Bible got a whole lot to say tonight about windows. We preached on eight or ten of them. I don't have time to get into all of them tonight. I'm going to use this one this evening. There are many different windows in your Bible uh, from Genesis chapter 6 and that window in the ark all the way till we find there are windows in heaven tonight and everywhere in between. But this window we're examining tonight, listen to what I'm going to say and don't forget this, this is the most dangerous window in the Bible. The most dangerous window in the Bible is this window we're going to look at tonight. You say, preacher, why is this a dangerous window? Because somebody falls out of it and dies. There's only two windows in the Bible that somebody falls out of and dies when they do. One is found in the book of Kings where uh, uh, they push Jezebel out a window and she hits the ground and dies. The only other window in the Bible is somebody falls out of, topples out of, and knocks the very breath of life out of them is Acts chapter 20 at this church service where Paul is preaching. Tonight I'm using this text and I'm preaching on the window of sleep. The window of sleep. And can I say something about this window on the way into the message? Now you may catch me saying window, winder. That's the same thing where I come from, okay? Uh, we put an ER on the end of everything where I come from. Y'all like that tonight? And so it, if I say winder, it means window. Okay, let me go ahead and interpret for you so ain't nobody confused about what I'm preaching on. And here we find this window is not only a dangerous window, but I want you to understand something. Even though this is a dangerous window, it's not in a dangerous place tonight. Do you see where this window is? It's in a good place. It's in the place, the Bible said, Brother Harris, where the disciples have gathered for Paul to preach to them. It's the church service. This is the place that has been set apart, sanctified, and set up for the use of the meeting, the preaching, the teaching, and the worship, and the fellowship of the saints of God. It's the first day of the week. It's on Sunday. The man of God's there. The church is there. They have met to worship. They have met to hear preaching. They have met to learn something about the Word of God. But even though this window is not in a dangerous place, something dangerous happens anyways. Now I want you to understand something. I'm glad that you're here. I'm tickled death you sitting here tonight but if you think that just because you sitting in this place that doesn't mean you can't go to sleep spiritually and wind up falling out from this place and injuring yourself and injuring your life and your children's life you got another thing coming tonight not only is this not in a dangerous place it's not around dangerous people it ain't like there's a bunch of dope smoking hippies all up in this place right here it ain't like they're all sitting around with Budweiser and drinking liquor and cussing and raising cattle this is the disciples of God and here's that great apostle of the Gentiles the apostle Paul is preaching I mean brother it's not dangerous people around this boy it's not in a dangerous place where they are tonight but just because he's in a safe place and just because he's around safe people it doesn't mean something dangerous ain't fixing to happen to his life tonight now I want y'all to understand something I don't believe this boy came to church with the idea he was going to fall asleep and fall out you know what I found it ain't hard to go to sleep and I'm talking about physically it's not hard to go to sleep I mean some of y'all might have got up early and worked a long shift today and now you're here tonight and it's dawning on 8.15 and you're sitting there and you, you, you're doing everything you can to keep mental acuity to try and keep your eyes from doing this number here I found out I've got a gift I can put adults and children to sleep while I preach I can do it I've got a gift to do so tonight I tell you, it's not hard to go to sleep tomorrow night after church me and that little boy is going to hit the road. We have church on Thursday nights where I come from. And so when I get done preaching tomorrow night, we're going to crawl in that ram and we're going to hit the road for about seven, seven and a half hours back to the house. Now I've found this out. Even though I am looking forward to getting back to mama, even though I want to get back to my wife uh, and give her some smooching uh, and brother go get in my bed and go to sleep. Uh, brother, even though I'm desirous to be home, I want to be home. That don't mean about 2.30, 3.30 in the morning. Uh, I'm going to need some assistance, brother. 
I'm going to have to pull into a flying J or a pilot somewhere and get a monster energy drink about that tall and a Slim Jim about the same length that will help me wake me up, wire me up. I'm going to have to crank my stereo up. Y'all don't even know. Y'all stereo going to be, brother, y'all CD going to be invaluable tomorrow night going home. I'm going to need some help. And I'm going to crank it up, slap myself in the face. Why? Because it's not hard to go to sleep tonight. And you know what? You, you can be sitting in a church service. You can be reading your Bible. You can be praying. And you can be around the things of God. And certain areas of your life just get like sadistical. Just get a little bit lax on it. And you can just go to sleep. You say, why is the preacher having meeting like this? How come we have revivals like this? You know what this is? This is the deep part of the night, brother. And the preacher knows we need a little something to give us a shot to keep us going down the road. So you know what this is? This is a spiritual monster energy drink. This is a spiritual pick-me-up that wakes us up, shakes us up, and reminds us what we are really here to do tonight. I want to show you several things very quickly about this window of sleep. It's a dangerous window. It's a window that too many of God's people sit in tonight. I'm going to give you three points and we're going to go. Number one, the first thing I see in this window is I see a young disciple's life in this window. There is a young disciple's life in this window. Now look what your Bible said in verse 9. It said there's set in a window a certain young man named Eutychus. Now I don't know how old this boy was. It doesn't tell us. It just says he's a young man. Could be he's a teenager. Could be he's 21, 22, 23 years old. I don't know. I just know he is a younger individual here tonight. Really, it's not the age that's so important. It's the fact that this boy is going to end up with some problems in his life. Now let me say two things in this point about this young disciple's life. We find this young disciple's life was a fortunate life. It was a fortunate life. If his name here in the text said, they're setting a window a certain young man named Eutychus. You say, what kind of name is that? Well, if you'd have fell out a window, you'd have cussed too. Amen. But here we a certain, certain young man named Eutychus tonight. That the word Eutychus literally means the fortunate one or a fortunate son. Obviously, his parents looked at this boy's life and when they named him, they said, this boy is going to be fortunate to have opportunities, hear things, and see things that other people are not going to have opportunity to have. There's something about this boy's life. He's going to be fortunate to enjoy some things that other people may not get the opportunity to enjoy. And may I say, he's enjoying them here. Brother, look how fortunate he is. He doesn't even know how fortunate he is. Here he is sitting, brother, in a church service and he is hearing the greatest preacher outside of Jesus and John the Baptist that ever wore shoe leather. He is sitting there listening to the man that's going to pin a good portion of the New Testament and he is dropping doctrinal gold on them and this boy doesn't even realize he is sitting there and he is just taking it all for granted. He's sitting there saying, well, I sure wish this to get over with because I got something I want to go to the house and do. I got other things I'm interested in. I wish he'd shut up. Man, I'm tired of the singing. I'm tired of hearing this dude preach. I wish this thing just be over with. He doesn't realize how fortunate his life really is tonight. Listen to what I'm telling everybody in here from the youngest to the oldest. You are a fortunate individual tonight. All you young people sitting here, you don't realize how fortunate you are. But brother, you are fortunate to be in a place like this and hear singing like that and have a pastor like that and get to be involved in meetings like this. Let me just take a time out right here and say this. I am sick and tired, Preacher Foster. I have had it up to here with my generation that was raised in meetings like this and now that they've gotten older, they resist the preaching that they heard they resent what they were raised up around and they swing way left and they make fun of what they used to be and the standards they used to have and the life they used to live that kept them away from the world and kept them away from the devil let me just stop and say I thank God for my heritage I thank God for my upbringing I thank God I was fortunate enough to hear preaching like this 
and singing like that and worship like this. I was fortunate to be around God's people like y'all tonight and I'm not mad about it. I'm tickled to death. It has made me what I am today. You don't realize how fortunate you are. Some of you young people, the upbringing you got and stuff like this, it's what's kept your life pure. It's what's kept your life clean. Some of y'all mamas and daddies in here, you may not realize how fortunate you are that your children get to hear a preacher like that preach on a regular basis. And you might not always like everything he says to your baby, but you ought to appreciate the fact that he ain't trying to be some limp-wristed fairy and get up here and just go right with the flow and tell them what they want to hear. He's giving them the truth of the Word of God tonight. See, this young disciple's life is a fortunate life, but it's not just a fortunate life. This young fellow's life is a fallen life. Just because he's in the right place and he's around the right people don't mean he can't fall. Matter of fact, look what it said here in verse 9. It said they're sitting in a window, a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And boy, he's going to fall. You know, it said he was falling into sleep. Paul was long preaching. He sunk down with sleep. He fell down from the very loft. Paul went, verse 10, down and fell on him. I mean, brother, he just goes down, down, down. I mean, I don't know if that's where Johnny got the song out or not, but he just went down, down, down. I mean, his whole life just goes on a pattern. It just goes... You know something about this fella tonight? Brother Ernie, I look at this boy's fallen life. He, he didn't appreciate how fortunate he was. He was kicking back everything that was coming at him. He didn't want to hear it. And listen to what I'm fixing to tell you. Ain't no amount of long preaching going to wake him up. Paul's preaching a long time here. And no amount of long preaching is going to wake him up. I believe Paul was a loud preacher. You say, how do you know that? I was just reading this morning in 2 Corinthians where they said his speech is rude and contemptible. He wasn't couth. Ain't no amount of loud, long, rude preaching in your face going to wake his boy up. Don't miss this. You know what's going to wake him up? It's going to take a fall. The only thing that's going to wake this boy up is he's going to have to fall clear on to the bottom end. That's the only thing going to wake him up. And some of y'all tonight, you've been preached to, you've been prayed over. I mean, they uh, watched you and asked God to do something, instructed you, but there ain't nothing going to do you. You done made your mind up, you're going to do your thing, and you are on your trajectory to a all the way. And when you finally hit the ground, you're going to say, My God, I don't wind up right here. I didn't ever think I'd fall all the way down here. But did you notice when he fell, he didn't determine how far he fell. When you start falling, you don't decide, well, I'm just going to get off at the second story. Well, I'm going to just go to the first. No, no, no. And did you notice when he went down, there wasn't no stairway when you fall. You don't fall out gently. It's a hard fall. It's all the way three stories. Yeah, bam. You know, some, some people don't think wake them up as a fall. I was thinking about Luke chapter 15 over there. Brother Foster, Luke chapter 15, that prodigal son, wasn't nothing going to do him but to go see the far country. It didn't matter how much his daddy begged him not to go. It didn't matter how much his daddy instructed him not to go. He just made his mind up. I don't care. I'm going to go see what's out there. I want to see it. I mean, he's pulling a glorified diner. He has gone out to see the daughters of the land. He wants to scope out everything that mama wouldn't let him see and daddy wouldn't let him see. And you know when he finally woke up? The Bible said he hit the bottom. He spent it all, wound up in a blessed fired hog pen, and he finally said he came to himself. How many of my fathers, hired servants, got bread to spare? I perished with hunger. How wind up here? 
I read where them disciples, them disciples, Jesus got Peter, James, and John in the garden of Gethsemane. They said, boy, let's go pray. I need you to pray with me. I need you to pray with me. Watch him pray. You need to temptation. Spirit's willing, flesh is weak. And Jesus prays, comes back. They go on to sleep. Jesus wakes them up, goes back and prays. They come back, they go on to sleep. Jesus goes away the third time, prays, comes back. They're still asleep. And you know what Jesus finally tells them? Sleep on now. If me giving you tender admonition and telling you wake up, the spirit's well and the flesh is weak, if a tender admonition don't wake you up, there's something coming down the dusty road that's fixing to wake you up. And son, it shook them awake so bad they didn't ever go back to sleep spiritually again. Oh, Peter and the rest of them, when Judas come and Jesus got crucified, that was something that shook their life to the core. If you won't wake up, the Lord will finally just say, fine, keep on sleeping. I'm going to send something into your life that's going to wake you up. You won't never go back to sleep. If listening to tender admonition like what I'm giving you don't wake you up, you say, that's tender compared to what God could send it is. This is real tender compared to what could come to shake your life up. We find there's a young disciple's life in this window of sleep. I got to hurry. Not only there's a young disciple's life, but we find that it's also a yanked down life. It's not just a young disciple's life, it's a yanked down life. Here I told you, he just goes down, down, down. I thought to myself, how come this life got yanked down tonight? And I figured out the reason why it got yanked down. It was yanked down because it was near the edge. The Bible says that he's sitting in a window. Why? Why? Is he as far out as he can get instead of as far in as he can get? He's getting just as close to the edge as he can get. I know why he was sitting in the window. I can tell you exactly why he's sitting in the window. Y'all want to know why he was sitting in the window? I'm going to tell you whether he wanted it or not. I'll tell you why he was sitting in the window. He was more concerned with what was going on out there than he was what was happening in here. He was more allured and enamored by what was happening outside the church house than he was what was going on inside the church house. I mean, he, he's propped up there in his window right near the edge and he's looking out and he said, What's up, girl? You got digits? Hey, hey, hey. I know mom and daddy don't like me listening to it, but I got this, I got this new album on iTunes. You got this thing too? You got this new CD on, on iTunes? You got this? I know they don't like it. I, I, check me out on TikTok sometime. Check me out on Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. I, that, mom and daddy will we, private message. You'll never see it. Won't you check me out? Hold on, hold on. He's preaching. Let me act like I'm interested here a minute. All right, now. Wait, 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 a couple later. You know why he was near the edge? He was interested in what was outside, not what was inside tonight. You want to know a real recipe for falling asleep and falling out? Just get more interested on what the world's doing out there than what God's doing up in here tonight. I tell you this too. I know exactly why he fell out. You know why he fell out? You say, yeah, he was in the window. I got more than that. You know why he fell out? Because he was leaning that way. Isn't it something, Brother Foster, that when he went to sleep, he didn't fall in? When he went to sleep, he fell out. Why is that? That's the direction he was already leaning. I can predict your direction of life by which way you already leaning. Why is it you can automatically spot some people? It don't matter whether they're teenagers or adults. You can already spot some people and they start to get edgy. They get edgy. I mean, they, they start getting it. You can watch it. They start getting edgy in their music they listen to. Well, I can't really say it's wrong. Can't really say it's right. But I mean, it's not all bad. It's just it's edgy. You ever watch some people? You can't put your finger on it, but it's just, it's just smacks of the world. They, they start getting edgy in their music. They start getting edgy in the way they dress and present themselves. And, and they just, I, I mean, it's not something I can just give a clear scripture for and say, that's wrong, but you look at Brother Foster, it's like... 
That's, that's getting edgy. They start getting edgy in their friends. The friends they have. It ain't the spiritual folk in the church. It's, it's the carnal, carnal people they can find in the church that's trying to cause problems. Or they start getting edgy with people that ain't even from the church. It's just, it just, it just edgy. You can always predict which way a tree is going to fall by which way it starts leaning. Boy, and here we find, oh, Eutychus, he falls the exact direction that he was leaning, and it's because he was near the edge. Let me just pause right there and say this. Young people, there ain't nothing wrong with getting all the way in. There ain't nothing wrong. Make your mind up. I don't want to get on the edge. I'm going to get just as far in this thing, neck deep as I can. I don't want to get close to the edge. I don't want to know the lyrics of the latest song. I don't want to know the latest fashion. I want to get just as close to God as I can tonight. So when though asleep, it was, uh, is he yanked down life because it was near the edge? Can I say it was also yanked down because he had no encouragement? I believe he was yanked down because there was no encouragement. I thought to myself, I look at this and I think, where's mom and daddy at? Why didn't they say, hey boy? I mean, why didn't mom and daddy walk over and say, hey boy, you're getting too close to the edge. You're going to get over here and sit with us. You ain't getting over there on the edge. I'm going to help you if you ain't going to help yourself. I'm going to be smart enough not to let the devil get you. I'm going to get you back over here with me. Where's mom and daddy at? I am blown away in this day we live that mom and daddy absolutely do not help keep children away from the edge. Now, look, I ain't stupid. I understand that there are some kids that's raised around the right stuff and with the right stuff and prayed over and they still go astray. God is the greatest father that ever lived and had backslid children. I get that. But brother, though, may I say those are exceptions to the rule? They make the rules. And the rule is, if a mom and daddy is unconcerned about their child's life spiritually, they're probably going to fall out. And if there's a mom and daddy that's concerned enough to call their child out and say, this is the way woke you in it, they stand a lot better chance of living for God down the road somewhere. I mean, I've always been, I've always been blown away. I like this church. Say, why do you like it? Because you keep your young people up close. I like it. I don't know if that's on purpose or accident. I don't, I, I don't know. I like how all these young people's either sitting with their parents or if they're not with their parents, they up close. I like that. I have always been blown away when I go to some places that the parents sit on the front row and their teenage children sit all the way on the back row. And I get up there and I'm preaching and I look and I see mom and daddy, they're locked in, son. But the child's sitting back there doodling on their phone and ain't paying attention. And I'm thinking, hey, you, you, you don't even know what's going on behind you and obviously you don't even care. What, what, not, look, I know this ain't blessed because of another tonight, but brother, it's good preaching even if I am doing it, friend. I'm talking about tonight there was no encouragement this evening. You'll know the worst thing you can do for your child's life is when that man right there gets up in the pulpit and preaches truth from the Word of God, and then you go home and demonstrate to your children that you ain't going to do nothing, he said. You know what you're telling your child? You're telling your child, we ain't got to do nothing that dude says. No matter what he said, he just up there hollering. We ain't got to do what he said. We'll just do what we want to do. Bro, look here. That, there was no encouragement. And I don't know where all these young people come from. I got no clue. You may have come from a home where you ain't got a mama or a daddy to encourage you. May I say, you can pull a David and encourage yourself in the Lord. You know what I've watched? I watched my own wife when she was a teenage girl not have support up from her parents to be able to live for God. And she made her mind up, I'm going to serve God by myself. If you want to live for God you can tonight the window of sleep it's a young disciple's life it's a yanked down life I'm through lastly we find there is the yielding of a damaged life the damaged life gets yielded look what it says here it, the Bible said that he falls all the way down verse 10 I love this don't miss this and Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, his life's in him. Verse 12, 
and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. In other words, they were tickled to death. They was happy about it. Can I say this before I give you my two little sub points on this yielded, uh, yielding of the damaged life? Did you notice who it was that got him up after he fell? Yeah. It's the guy he didn't want to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. Yeah. The feller he didn't want to listen to that he sat over there and said, I don't care what he says. I don't want to listen. Uh, I've heard all this before. I'm tired of hearing that preacher preach it. The guy he didn't want to listen to is the guy that walked all the way down there where he was and said, I'm going to help you up. I'll get you up. Can I say this tonight? You may not appreciate nothing that's getting preached this evening or that man preaches right there. But I promise you this, if you ever fall out, the first one that'll be there to help get you up and get you right and get your life straightened out is the preacher. Yeah, that's the truth. We find this yielding of the damaged life happened just a little bit late. It happened a little bit late. I thought to myself, looking at this, maybe Brother Phil, if this fellow would have gotten closer sooner, this wouldn't have happened to him. Now, thank God it has a happy ending. I'll get to that in just a minute. Thank God for it. But before we get to the happy ending, let me say this. Some people sit there and just think, well, I brought my kids to church. Well, they're at church. Yeah, this guy was too. But there's more than just getting them here. There's example that has to follow out yonder too. And I thought to myself, if he would have gotten right sooner, woke up sooner, this wouldn't have happened. I also thought to myself, you know, when you fall, there's scars that comes along with a fall. The Bible said he got his life back. But y'all listen to me. You don't fall three stories what it don't break you up, scratch you up, scuff you up. He got his life back, but it don't say nothing about when he come back, he wasn't broke up. I believe this with all my heart. I believe when he come walking back in, I ain't getting back over near that window no more. I'll tell you that right now. I believe when he finally got back, he wasn't getting, he wasn't getting on the edge no more. He got just as far in as he could. You know when you go to sleep and fall out, you don't always just fall out by yourself like this guy did. Sometimes you yank people out with you when you go. I was, I was, preaching, I was preaching one time and uh, got done preaching at a church actually in Kentucky. And when I got done, I noticed uh, that during that week there's a lady uh, that, that had a little grandbaby with her. Uh, but she, it was just her and the grandbaby every night. And she sat along over here near where Brother Harris is at on about second, third row there on the aisle. And, uh, I got done preaching that night, and, and she stood up and said, Preacher, can I give a word of testimony? He said, Sure, sis. And she walked up to the platform and got up there and said, uh, I just want to tell everybody this. Just because you get back in after you've fallen out don't mean the people you drug out with you gets back in when you come back. She said, this little baby I'm holding, this is my granddaughter. This is my daughter's child. She said, about 15 years ago, I got mad about some stuff that happened in this church that was stupid. It didn't make a hill of beans difference. She said, and I fell out. But when I fell out, I drug my daughter out with me. And I infected her with the bitter spirit that I had towards things that happened that didn't matter. She said, preacher, I got right. And you know I got right. And he said, yeah, I remember when you did. And she said, I got right. And I've been back here now for several years. But my daughter didn't come back with me. She said, this is a byproduct of my daughter being out of church. Now the will of God and now I'm having to raise my grandbaby and try and keep her in church and she said I, with tears running off her face she said I want to let everybody know you don't always go to sleep and fall out by yourself some people fall out with you and they don't come back when you come back listen mom and daddy there's a lot more at stake than just you staying awake uh, there's babies watching uh, that if you fall out they're watching the example tonight the yielding of the damaged life was a little bit late, but the yielding of the damaged life, I love this, it happened at the Lord's house. Look at what it said. The Bible said in verse 12, they brought the young man alive. They brought, I love this, they brought him back to where he fell out from. He got back in where he fell out. 
You know the problem with people today? They don't ever get back in where they fell out from, and so their Christian life stays stunted the rest of their life. Some people think they can just fall asleep, hurt the church, hurt everybody in the church and fall out and then just run off down the road and start a Christian life somewhere else. You don't never advance in your Christian life like that. You go back to where you fell out from and make things right before God will ever let you move on tonight. Here we find when he did get right, when he got alive, when he got up from the dead, when the sleep got wiped off, he got back in the church. I say, thank God, there's a place of re-enlistment. There's a place of reinstatement. There's a place of refreshment. There's a place of revival. And it's at the house of God. I'm glad when he come back in, you don't read where nobody was looking down her nose and saying, I told you you shouldn't have fell out. I told you you should have stayed in. No, no, no. It said they were not a little comforted. In other words, when he come in, they said, glory to God, you to kiss her. Hallelujah. Thank God God brought my boy back. Thank God God brought our young man back. Hey, tonight, friend, if you're a bitter, bitter critical, mean-spirited Pharisee, you got no real place in the house of God. Brother, we're here to try and help people up. We're here to try and get people up after they've fallen. Tonight, I'm trying to keep you from falling out the window. I'm trying to keep you from going to sleep. But if you do go to sleep, if you do fall, out, you always remember there'll be a place there'll be a place there'll be a preacher there'll be some people that'll love you and help you get up after you've fallen brother Cody would you help me over here y'all give us a song you know the bible says this be sober be vigilant be awake be alert your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walked about seeking him, he may devour. Can I say this to you? If it is possible for men the caliber of Peter, James, and John to go to sleep in a prayer meeting with Jesus, it's highly possible for any of us in here to go to sleep. If it is possible for a young man named Eutychus sitting under the greatest pastor of the New Testament Church Age of Grace, if it's possible for a man named Eutychus to go to sleep with the Apostle Paul preaching, it's possible for everybody in here to go to sleep tonight. From right here to out yonder. Every last one of us. You say, preacher, what should a prayer be at the end of a message like this? God, help me stay awake. God, I want to stay awake. I want to keep my spiritual eyes open. You say, how do I do that? The best thing to do is to stay close to the Word of God. Whether that's reading it or being around the preaching of it, you say, why? Because it's light. Yes, Have you ever tried to go to sleep with somebody shining a 10,000 watt spotlight right in your eyeball? It's tough to do. And brother, the best way to stay awake is stay close to that book, whether in reading it or where it's preached, because it's the light that shines in your eyes. And brother, if you're going to reject it, you're going to have to do the best you can to try and block it out. But if you're honest tonight... The light will wake you up. It'll wake us up. That's why we have revival meetings like this, to keep us awake and alert and to stay out of the window of sleep. We've been real fortunate tonight to live in America where we get to hear this and have this in freedom. Let's not take it for granted and go to sleep on it. That's why we're losing what we're losing today. That's why you can have absolute bumbling fools like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris running on the Democratic ticket because America has wholesale gone to sleep. How in the world can we have what we see in our country today, the wicked immorality and, and, the, and the condoning of it wholesale because we've just gone to sleep. We, we just got fortunate. We've just gone to sleep on it. Tonight, let's pray God help us wake up. Help us be wide awake. Let's all stand this evening. Father, I pray you'd bless this message. God, use a simple little thought from the Word of God. Take the admonition from the Apostle Paul after he saw this event of this young man. He said, knowing the time, it's high time to wake out of sleep. He said, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead. Christ shall give thee light. No, no doubt, no doubt. He wrote these things because of events he saw in his own personal ministry. God, tonight I pray that you would help us. 
God, how anybody could be asleep in a place like this, and I mean asleep spiritually, with the singing we've heard and the sweet spirit of God running all around this place tonight, I have no idea, but maybe there's somebody that's just an area or a certain spot of their life. They just got a little comfortable and at ease in Zion. God, tonight I pray we'd wake up once again, wake up on things we've let ourselves go to sleep on. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.